Then you would talk about, well, what are some MOGO alternatives, MOGO meaning most good, and then how can we find out what we would do from, from, from here. Um, and one thing I want to mention is that we give this true price presentation a lot because it really does a nice snapshot of showing the power of human education. And my boss was giving this at um, a National Honor Society um, coronation once, and a young woman, a high school woman, came up to her after that, and she was so angry. And she said, why haven't we been learning this since we were in kindergarten? This is so important. I can't believe this. She was a senior just about to graduate. And she was incensed. She wanted to know about this. People and kids want to know about this kind of stuff. Um, I also want to mention that you can do this sorts of things with ingredients. It doesn't have to be products. I just threw up palm oil here because palm oil is in beauty products, it's in food products, it's all over the place. So again, you can analyze it and look at the impacts, positive and negative, on people, animals, and the planet. Another example of a human education activity, this one is called analyzing advertising. So you're looking through the lens of media and marketing. So with this particular activity, you ask a series of questions about an ad. What product or service is it selling? What ne deep need or desire is the ad appealing to? Who's the intended audience? Who's excluded by the ad? What suffering, exploitation, or destruction is hidden from view? And that's an important one that a lot of people don't think about. You do get some media literacy sometimes in schools and organizations are looking at, but they're very rarely looking at that deep a level. How does the ad affect your personal desires and what would life be like without the product? So I've got two ads, we're gonna pick one. I usually do the Slim Fast ad, but I recently came across the Burger King ad. This just came out a few days ago, and I was like, oh, I have to put that one up. Um, so which one shall we do? Which one shall we analyze? Super 7-inch. All right, we'll do the Super 7-inch. So, and here are the questions again. So what product or service is the ad selling? <laughs> well, it, it's a, the product is actually selling, yes. The subtext is it's selling sex. But the actual product is the BK Super 7 incher. What deep need or desire is it appealing to? Sex. Sex. <laughs> right? I right. always right. Hunger, right? Sex. Who's the intended audience? Men. Men, men especially. <laughs> horny yeah. men, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who's excluded by the ad? Women. Women. Vegetarians. Vegetarians <laughs> or vegans, right? Anybody who wants a quality or not? Right, people who aren't white, okay? There's a lot of exclusion there. Um, what suffering, exploitation, or destruction is hidden from view? Everything? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Liz, but let's be more specific. <laughs> so you've got the meat in there, so you've got the negative impact on animal, you've got the cheese, you've got all the in food ingredients and the, how the workers were involved, the workers who grew it. You've got the whole transportation issues of all that food. You've got the sexual objectification of women. And we could go well, on. Global warming, from the animal food workers, they yep. get their jobs. Yep, Those exactly. Conditions. Yeah, and yeah, and you see, we could go on and on and on. And then there are two more questions, but we won't go on because of, of time's sake. But again, you can see how taking one little thing and really opening up that global perspective, it's like this is one ad, but look at everything that it's showing and that it's hiding. and. We don't think about those things and think about how much we're bombarded by advertising and marketing every day and especially kids. Yes? How do you take that and present it to people who are not us? Like uh, having people reach the same conclusions that we just did without them obviously being like activists. Well, um, kids, if kids don't know about these issues, then you help talk them through them. Um, a lot of times they know at least a little something and again, you don't have to do this with kids, you can do this with an adult audience. And one thing that you do is go through this with a group and then the way this actually works is there's a precursor and you talk about advertising and the impact of advertising, then you do a run through of this and then you divide them into little groups and give them their own sets of ads, let them pick one and do it. And just from the virtue of doing it once, they start to, together, they start to see those sorts of things for themselves that if you didn't ask them to think critically before, they never would have noticed. But now that you're asking them to pay attention and really analyze, they're like, oh. So they get it. That, that, some of that knowledge is already sort of there. Um, but then you can also help, help guide them. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. OK. So um, going back to Please Pass the Gorilla, which was I mentioned that I do the chicken crate and the survey where I was asking if whether you eat cows and gorillas and so on. Um, I just wanted to mention that the next part of what I do with that, or a, a big part of what I do with that, is that I give everybody in the audience 
a card that has a farmed animal on it, so pig or a male battery chick or a female dairy cow, and then I ask them to tap into their empathy and their imagination and actually become that animal. And then I take them through the lives and deaths of those animals. I have a series of, of slides that I show and then I give them factual information and I talk in the second person. So if we're talking about the male battery chicks, how many of you have the male battery chicks card? Okay, this is your life. This is what happens to you. And of course with the male battery chicks it's a really short life. <laughs> um, but it, it seems to be even more powerful than showing them a graphic video like Meet Your Meat or Peaceable Kingdom or Earthlings because some people can't find that so graphic that it turns them off and it shuts them down. It's too emotionally wrenching and they can't deal with that. This way of doing it, I show photos that are still somewhat graphic but much less graphic. But because they're trying to internalize it, they're empathizing, it's much, a much more visceral experience and a really powerful experience. So that's just another example of using humane education. Uh, we're going to do one last humane education activity. I need eight volunteers for this one. Can I have eight volunteers? Come on up, right here. Actually, I lied. Come on up, right over here. Okay, that's three. <coughs> this one's easy. Now, this is a mini example of an activity that you could do um, on farm animal issues for younger kids for like grades two through five. Okay, so everybody take a blue slip and pass it on. Do not open the blue slip. <coughs> Just take one and pass it on. And then do the same with the purple slip, but don't open either slip yet. So you see that I have pig habitat, chicken habitat, cow habitat, human habitat. And if I were actually doing this in front of a class or a group, I would actually have nice habitats drawn or created or something. But for the purposes of today, I just slapped up a sign. Okay, so this is what you're going to do. For, and don't do anything yet. First, you're going to open the blue slip. Not yet, though. <laughs> Not till I say go. You'll open the blue slip. You'll read it. You'll determine who you are and then you go to your appropriate habitat. So if you open the slip and it says, I move, you're most likely a cow, cow and you go to the cow habitat. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't open the purple one yet. Open the blue one, read about who you are and find your habitat. <laughs> Josh didn't have to move very far. Okay, so let's just read a couple of the blue slips. What do you have? I have a snout. I have a snout. I like to wallow in the mud. Okay. I pick the ground for things to eat. I like to roost at night. I have four stomachs. I have fur. I read books. I ride a bug. Okay, so those are all things that are pretty specific to the different species of animals. Right. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing with your purple slip. So open your purple slip and read it, and then find your habitat. A little bit more confused. Okay, everybody stop. So let's read some of those. I have a good memory. I have a good memory. I can play computer games. I can play computer games. I have friends. I have friends. I know my name. I know your name. I speak a unique language. Uh -huh. I babysit others' kids. Uh -huh. I get bored. I recognize faces. Yeah. So, those are all qualities and characteristics that animals and humans share. Just taking computer games, playing computer games. What's that? I thought we named the animals. I, I think that's, that's from. That's true, but they, they, they can't recognize their names. Right, so thank you. You can just toss the slips on the table and go ahead and sit down. So take playing computer games, for example. You would right away think, well, obviously that's a human thing, right? But actually, not that they would do it uh, by themselves on purpose. You know, not if you set a Nintendo down in the chicken coop would they automatically go over and play it. But because of scientific study, they have learned to play computer games and play well. Other um, animals can make friends, all those things that we talked about. So this is a great way of inspiring kids to think about the similarities that they have with farmed animals, 
to think about farmed animals in a different context, to learn more about their behaviors and their intelligences, and to get them outside of that stereotype of being stupid or lazy or tasty or anything like that. So it's a great exercise that gets them curious and thinking critically, and then you can take that and go on from there. Jessica, you had a question? Or, no, I'm sorry. Have you ever done that with, done this exercise with adults? No. Well, actually, this, let me take that back. This is uh, an, an activity that one of our master students created, and she did it for the first time last summer at our residency, and she was doing it with adults, but it's, it's gauged for kids. But there's no reason that you couldn't adapt it for an adult audience. I don't have any access to, to kid audiences, yeah. but I could yeah. get together. Most humane education activities, whether they're for kids or adults, you can figure out a way to adapt into a different audience. Okay. Um, I want to mention that if you go to humaneeducation.org, which is the website for the Institute for Humane Education, you can find in the Resource Center humane education activities, all the ones that we've talked about and done today, plus a whole bunch more. Um, I also want to point out there are lots of other resources. You can find all kinds of books that have humane education activities and such out there. One I want to mention, this one's by my boss, um, The Power and Promise of Humane Education. It talks all about humane education, how to use it with different age, age groups in different contexts, and um, it also has sample humane education activities in it, but all of these are on our website. One last bit I want to emphasize is that we as humane educators, if we are going to be credible and we're gonna be effective, then we have to make sure that we're living the message, focusing on uh, Gandhi's mantra of my life is my message. So if we want to really be positive world changers for kids and adults, then we have to focus on am I making choices in my own life that are doing the most good and the least harm for all people, all animals, and the planet? Am I making good, personal choices, and am I working for positive systemic change? Just a couple of things I want to say about the Institute for Humane Education. We have a Master of, Humane, a Master of Education in Humane Education, which is accredited through Cambridge College. We also have the Humane Education Certificate Program, which I mentioned before, that's what I got. Both of those are distance learning programs, so you can take them from anywhere. And we actually have several students and graduates from Portland and Seattle, both. Uh, we have them from all over the country and even some internationally. We also offer some workshops such as our Sowing Seeds workshop and MOGA workshop. Sowing Seeds is more for activists and educators who want to learn how to do educa humane education. And the MOGA workshops are more for people who are interested in transforming the personal choices that they make and then working on systemic uh, change. And we also offer those courses, Sowing Seeds and MOGO, as online courses, 30-day courses. And you can find out all about that on the website, humaneeducation.org. I also want to mention that we have a lot of resources um, on our website. We have a blog. We do an electronic newsletter. We have social media sources. Those are all the things, all things that I do as the web content community manager. But those resources are available if what you heard today intrigued you and you wanted to learn more about human education and doing human education. And I also wanted to mention, again, that you, if you live here in the Portland area and this intrigued you and you think that you might like to actually do humane education here in the Portland area, then I invite you to contact me um, and find out more about the group that we're starting, the Power of One Humane Education, and see whether or not that might be a good fit for you. So I thank you for your time. I hope that this was useful, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Can I give you examples right this minute? No. <laughs> but yeah, uh, back in uh, along the Fertile Crescent time, um, yeah, there were matriarchal societies. But did I mean? Were they? I mean, matriarchal doesn't necessarily mean they were more. Yeah. Yes. No. But but yeah, they were more focused on peace and cooperation. But that doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that everybody was vegetarian and those sorts of things. Well, no. But I mean, I just I'm trying to envision the path, like how this is going to actually play out. It's impossible. Yeah. Sustainable against the inherent selfishness in a lot of people. You know, I think definitely to some extent it is. I just would like to know if there's any 
Yeah, well, that's a really good question, and we all need to create that path together. And, you know, you can say, well, people are mean, and people are stupid, and people are evil, and we're inherently selfish. I don't necessarily believe that. I think that, yes, we have some biological genetic stuff that's in there, but I strongly believe that a lot of it is nurture and a lot, you know, think about racism and all the other isms. We don't pick that up biologically. That's, that's a learned thing. So if we're working on educating ourselves and educating others, just think about if everybody in this room all of a sudden decided, you know what, this resonated with me, I'm going to start making humane choices. So I'm going to start living my life and I'm going to share that with other people. Imagine what an impact we would have and, you know, it ripples on and on and on and on. So it's going to be a matter of personal transformation and changing systems, okay? Um, you know, people want to call factory farmers evil. People want to call vivisectors evil. People want to call people who destroy the environment or slave owners evil. Um, that's not necessarily the case. You know, a lot of people are trying to feed their families. They're trying to get by. It's systems, the destructive systems that, that um, really cause people, of course, we all have our personal choices that we make, but it really emphasizes doing things in a negative way, you know? So until we change those systems too, it's not just a matter of changing your light bulb, the CFLs and all the things, you know, the 50 simple things we can do to save the earth sort of thing, it's that systemic change. But if we're working on that together and we're working on it with our own passions and our own strengths, so that we're working in, a, in whatever careers that we're in and whatever our passions are, then that's all gonna come together and we're gonna head toward that positive vision. Somebody had their hand up over? Oh, I was just gonna say, I used to live in Mali in West Africa and there, there is a culture there that I live with and it was it kind of along the lines of, you know, so I know it's possible for humans to yes. live with animals in a way that's not just full of violence and destruction yeah. and consumerism. And so there's a lot of um, cultures that could teach us a lot out there. Which I think is a good thing, a yeah. positive thing yeah. for us. There's hope. Definitely. But think about when marketers are targeting us, you know, they're targeting us before we're even born now, but, but kids as young as two can name brands and have brand preferences. With all that systemic cultural pressure on us, no wonder it's so hard to make positive change. So we've just got to keep working toward that. Yes? Um, does this website also listen to literature for children that uh, talks about, you know, vegetarianism? That's an excellent question. Actually, that's one of the projects that I'm working on as, as the web person. Um, not, not yet. We don't have them up yet, but we will, within the next few months, we'll have a nice list of children's books that focus on humane issues. So, yeah, check back every couple of months, and eventually you'll see that. Other questions? Yes? Well, this is more about adults, but I'm wondering what your response would be. I have friends and family members who are big companion animal lovers, they give money to the Humane Society, they understand sort of about factory farming that it's bad, they won't look at videos because they don't want to be upset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they understand, I think it's really important not to, you know, not to eat meat, and, but they just can't go there. They say, well, we're going to cut down, mm -hmm. you know, I know I shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. and. I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do you say when you have someone who's sort of aware but doesn't realize you really need to take that step fully? You yeah. can't just be sort of. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I have struggled with as an activist. And I was one of the angry young activists. I didn't know anything about anything until I went to college. I grew up in small town Kansas, you know, in beef country, and my dad was a county agent. and. I didn't know anything about anything until I went to college and then I learned all these issues and I was so angry and wanted to change the world immediately and, uh, and I learned through a long um, process, a long journey that doggone it, we want to change people and we want to encourage them but we can't. It's, it's their journey. We can tell our piece, we can try to inspire, we can try to educate and empower but it's up to them to change and if they're not ready, they're not ready. So we can applaud them for the positive choices that they do make and we can continue to provide them with little bits and pieces of information. If they show any curiosity about anything, we can provide them with that. We can also try to work for systems that help make it much easier and more convenient for them to make those choices. So if vegan food, for example, is all over the place, it's in restaurants everywhere, it's really easy to fix. If there are 101 really simple vegan recipes that you can make in 10 minutes with you know, ketchup and, and a napkin, Sort of thing. <laughs> you know, those sorts of things. You know, the MacGyver way, veganism the MacGyver way. 
Um, so it's, it's a lot of those little sorts of things, but I've learned that you just can't push. And just as an example, um, I have fought with my mom for decades and pled and argued and argued the religious thing and the logical thing and the emotional thing and nothing worked. She was just la 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 la. You know, I would bring her vegan outreach literature, which is so credible and so accurate and so powerful. And well, how do you know this is true? And I grew up on a farm or blah blah blah. So finally, I just gave up. I was like, okay, I'm just going to accept her where she is. I'm not going to push her. And from stopping pushing her and just continuing to be myself. That has made more change in her than anything else. She still eats animals and she still eats animal products, but she's now proud of me. She now cares about what I do. She's now aware of the choice, my choices and why I'm making them, and she's more open. And I think if it were a lot easier for her to be vegan in the town where she lives, that she probably would be vegan, but because it's not easy and it's not convenient, she's not. So that was a really long-winded answer, but really there are, it's complex. It's not an easy answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other last questions? Yes. Are there any um, educational models in terms of schooling that align with human education, be it like Waldorf or Montessori? Or, I mean, I have a four and a half year old, and, and we're not sure what to do yet. So I was wondering if there's any that align somewhat with human education goals. Yeah, uh, aligning, exactly, no. Um, and there are people who want to create humane education charter schools and are sort of in the process of that. But there are alternative democratic schools out there, the Waldorf schools and Montessori schools that have somewhat of an overlap and they're at least more open to these sorts of things. Um, and then there are the things like, you know, Sunnyside Environmental Middle School who, who, um, who capture at least parts of that. Um, and then there's the Village Free School that's actually here in Portland, and they are really open to those sorts of ideas. Um, and there's the New Day School, I think they have a huge way. There's Who Day School? New Day. New Day? That's the, I think it's a Buddhist. Yeah. There's the vegan. Okay, yeah. So, yes and no. But one of the cool things is that you as parents can have a really positive and active role in what's being taught in your school. You know, you can either be hands off and, and go, ah, oh, that's really not how I want my kid to be taught. That's really, I'm not really happy with that. Or you can be really involved and, you know, you can't go up to the teacher and say you need to teach this sort of thing. But you can offer to provide materials. You can offer to provide information. You can... Um, offer to provide them with guest speakers who are humane educators who can teach about these sorts of things so you can really take an active role in helping modify the curriculum. And there's a great book called Black Ants and Buddhists um, that is about a, a teacher who taught, for, who teaches first and second grades and she teaches them social justice issues. Now unfortunately she doesn't teach them any animal protection issues, but she teaches them social justice issues. These little first and second graders, they're debating things about Columbus and genocide and you know, what was good and what was bad and those, I mean, they're really struggling and dealing with important issues and they're feeding the homeless and they're doing all kinds of awesome things and these are first and second graders. What's the name of the book again? Black Ants and Buddhists. Mary Cowie, C-O-W-A-G-Y is the author. It's an awesome book. But that just shows the power of what's possible with little kids. So was that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Um, any other last questions? The next session starts at 11, and I want to make sure you all get there in time. I'll hang out a couple of minutes if anybody has any other questions. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.